Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. This is session eight. We're continuing with the topic of syntax, and this time I'll say something about valency and about grammatical constructions. Now, as always, let's start with a little recap of what happened last time. Uh, last time I talked about phrase structure rules, those templates, building instructions, if you like, for phrases, noun phrases, verb phrases, prepositional phrases, and so on and so forth. What you see on the slide here are patterns that specify which elements are necessary in a respective phrase type and which elements are optional and how these elements are put in order. So for instance you see that a noun phrase obligatorily consists of a noun which can be preceded by a determiner and an adjective and um, which can be followed by a prepositional phrase or a relative clause. Right, so what these formulas then allow you to do is take a sentence written on the page and to analyze it into its um, syntactic structures, its phrases and uh, its combination of different phrases. Now. Uh, let me point out again that phrase structure rules, like the ones you see here, capture only a subset of all possible phrases of English. You can think of this as a kind of toy grammar, a simplified model of what English syntax is like. So sometimes you may encounter an English sentence and uh, you might try to analyze it into a tree using these phrase structure rules and somehow things don't work out. Well. That might be because these phrase structure rules are really too simple to capture what's going on in English syntax in the wild. Now, other things that I discussed. Um, we talked about ambiguity, and I distinguished two different types of ambiguity. Lexical ambiguity on the one hand, where a lexical item, a word, has different interpretations. Um, and then, more importantly, structural ambiguity where a phrase or a sentence has two different interpretations, not because there is some kind of lexical ambiguity, but because there are different syntactic structures that can be assigned to this phrase or sentence. Here again is the example of teachers getting sex and drugs advice. There are two possible syntactic analyses of this sentence, and depending on what analysis you pick, you get a different meaning. I also mentioned the uh, mixing bowl designed to please any cook with a round bottom for efficient beating. So there, depending on the syntax, uh, the round bottom either belongs to the bowl or to the cook. Moving on then, I also talked about grammatical relations, that is subject and object and I suggested a formal syntactic definition of subject and object, where subject is the daughter node of S and the sister node of VP. Um, so it's high up in the syntactic tree. Object, by contrast, is further down in the syntactic tree. It's the daughter of the VP node and it's the sister node of the verb. Right. Uh, why is this useful? Well, it's useful insofar as we can define notions like subject and object not with reference to semantic traits, like the subject is the one who does something, the object is something or someone who undergoes an action. Rather, we can say, well, these are structural notions that are uh, syntactic in nature. Okay, uh, today's topic, valency, on the one hand, and grammatical constructions on the other. Let's start with valency, which is a term that linguists have borrowed from chemistry. I know very little about chemistry. Uh, let me explain where this valency term uh, came from. Now, it appears that there are atoms that have a certain number of docking stations, if you like, so they can bond with a specified number of other atoms to form molecules. And some atom types have only a small number of these bonds, 
and other atoms have a larger number of bonds, so they can combine into larger and more complex molecules. Um, why am I talking about molecules? Well, uh, it turns out that some linguistic elements are not unlike these atoms, uh, specifically verbs. Valency most often talked about uh, in the context of verbs and verbal uh, combinatorics, the um, structures that occur with verbs. Uh, verbs typically impose restrictions on the kinds of elements, the kinds of structures that can occur with them, and that makes them similar to atoms. Now, uh, take a simple example like the English verb devour, as in John devoured the pizza. Nothing unusual there, but um, note that you can say John devoured the pizza, but you can't say John devoured, leaving out the direct object. It seems that devour specifies that an object needs to be there, otherwise the verb cannot be used. A second example, uh, John handed Bob a muffin. The verb hand is ditransitive. It takes two objects, a direct one and indirect one, and uh, both of these have to be present. You can't say John handed Bob or John handed a muffin. Both need to be there. John handed with two of them missing is still worse. Right, um, third example, the verb admit. Admit also takes two uh, elements, two players. Um, John admitted his mistake, that's a direct object, to Bob, that's an oblique object. Um, and, um, well, <clears throat> uh, John admitted, without these two, that doesn't work. John admitted to Bob, so just the oblique, not the direct object. That doesn't work either. What does work is John admitted his mistake. Yeah, so you can have just the direct object uh, without the oblique object, but not vice versa. Okay, um, what do we take home from this? Valency, restrictions on the kinds of structures that can occur with the verb, and uh, valency sort of gives a minimal specification, what needs to be there, and a maximal uh, specification of what elements can be there. <clears throat> There are at least two approaches that one can take to the analysis of valency. One of these is semantic. We can ask, okay, what is the, ver the verb's meaning? Uh, what situation is evoked by a verb and its meaning? And what participants uh, occur in the situation? So if we think of a devouring event, what persons, players are necessary in this devouring event? Well, uh, somebody who eats and something that is eaten. That seems to be essential to understanding an event of devouring. Um, with hand, um, what's necessary is somebody who gives, somebody who takes, and some thing that is given. Okay, So there are three players that somehow are essential to a situation of handing. Um, in admitting, we need an admitter, somebody who admits, something admitted, some dirty little secret, and a listener, uh, one who hears the admitting. Right. We can contrast the semantic approach to valency with a syntactic approach, uh, where we define valency as uh, a syntactic configuration uh, answering the question which participants have to be expressed. Uh, with devour, you've seen that, well, devour needs a subject and an object. Both need to be there. With hand, a subject, an indirect object, and a direct object, they all need to be there. With admit, the situation is a bit more complex. The subject and direct object need to be there. The oblique object can be expressed or can be left out. So John admitted his mistake is fine. John admitted his mistake to Bob. That's also fine. <clears throat> what this shows is that sometimes the semantic valency of a verb does not equal the syntactic valency of a verb. So admitting conjures up the image of somebody who listens to 
the thing that is admitted, but this somebody doesn't have to be expressed in all cases. So John admitted his mistake without a listener, that's fine. Also, John ate and ate without something eaten uh, being overtly expressed, that's fine. Semantic valency need not always coincide with syntactic valency. How then can we define valency? Um, well, uh, for the purposes of this course, we'll define valency as the number of participants um, that are specified by a verb. Um, devour then has a valency of two, it's a transitive verb. Hand has a valency of three, it's a ditransitive verb in linguistic parlance. And exist has a valency of one, that is, it's just the subject. John existed. Um, it's an intransitive verb. You recognize these terms, intransitive, transitive, transitive, ditransitive. And uh, the participants that are conjured up by the situations that these verbs evoke, they are called the arguments of the verb. Arguments. Now, uh, in the examples that you've seen so far, most arguments were noun phrases or involved noun phrases. <clears throat> but uh, some verbs also require other structures to co-occur with them. Um, take, for instance, a verb such as look. Look um, takes an argument that has the shape of an adjective. He looked pale. Uh, come takes an argument uh, that has the form of a prepositional phrase. We came to New York. Uh, want takes an argument that has uh, nothing nominal in it, that has just an infinitive clause. I want to go. Um, Start um, can take an ing clause as an argument. He started singing a song. Yeah? Singing a song, that's an argument of the verb start. And uh, the verb guess can take that clause as an argument. I guess that John will pass the exam. So arguments, not always MPs. Um, so, um, one thing that we need to distinguish are arguments that are obligatory, that always have to be there, and arguments that are optional. So participants evoked by the verb that are that can be expressed but need not always be expressed. Um, an example of an optional argument is the direct object of eat. Okay, uh, the children ate cake. That's the argument of something that is eaten. It's optional because we do find sentences such as the children ate with the eaten thing not being expressed. This is a syntactic um, feature of eat, you might say. It's not always there. Uh, take an example such as devour. Um, devour has to have the Was object. Sagst, I explain to these people what they I, I talk to the I talk to the computer. Ich rede mit dem Computer. Um, right. Um, so devour needs to have uh, both the subject and the direct object. The argument something eaten is obligatory. We can contrast that with adjuncts, which are always optional. Uh, adjuncts are not arguments, that is, they're not participants evoked by the verb. Uh, rather, they are additions to a sentence that can be left out. Um, think of quickly in uh, the children ate the cake quickly, or near Cyprus in the sentence the ship sank near Cyprus, uh, or the two infinitive clause um, in uh, John sang a song to embarrass his friends. You can leave these out and the sentences are still grammatical and importantly um, quickly is not something that is evoked necessarily by the verb eat. Okay, It's a quality that can be there or can't be there. How to tell arguments from adjuncts? Um, well, one criterion is repeatability. Adjuncts you can repeat, arguments you cannot repeat. Um, 
So uh, take a sentence like, the children devoured the cake at 2 p.m. on Monday, in which we have two temporal adjuncts. Um, or the children devoured the cake in Pittsburgh in a restaurant where you have two adjuncts specifying the place where something uh, happens. That works fine because these are adjuncts, but we cannot double arguments. We cannot say the children devoured the cake, the cream, in order to say, well, they ate uh, both the cake and the cream. So two arguments doesn't work, two adjuncts, that does work. Right. So far, I've talked about valency in terms of verbs only. Verbs combining with uh, different structures, noun phrases, other syntactic phrases. But the truth of the matter is that also other uh, syntactic categories have valency. So adjectives have valency too. If you have adjectives like ashamed, safe, renowned, easy, these can occur with certain types of syntactic elements. So ashamed can occur with a prepositional phrase starting in of. John is ashamed of his exam results. Uh, safe can occur with a two infinitive. The water is safe to drink. Um, renowned again can occur with a prepositional phrase for their love of uh, renowned for their love of beer and easy can occur with the two infinitive clause. John is easy to please. <clears throat> also nouns have valency. Um, nouns like attitude, tendency, connection, risk. Uh, attitude can occur with the prepositional phrase. John's attitude towards Belgians. Uh, tendency can occur with the two infinitive. John has a tendency to drink too much. Uh, connection also, prepositional phrase, connection between the two. Uh, risk also projects a prepositional phrase. There's a risk of getting mugged. Okay, that's what I had to say about valency. Now let's move on to grammatical constructions. And here I'm just going to give you a brief overview of a few important uh, types of construction. Now, um, so far, when we've been drawing our trees, we've had very simple English sentences, uh, such as John saw a talking duck on the porch. Uh, sentences that don't cause any substantial problems for the phrase structure rules that I uh, gave you. But there are many English sentences that differ in structure from these simple examples. Uh, for instance, the man I met yesterday is called Frank, or, I would like to try some of the white wine, please. Or, uh, while it was raining yesterday, it is sunny today. Um, if you want, you can pause this video and try to draw trees uh, for these sentences on the basis of the phrase structure rules that we have discussed. And um, it will be instructive to see where exactly problems occur. Um, okay, you can do that now if you like. I'm going to continue. Uh, talking about what types of grammatical constructions uh, there are. We can start with a simple uh, case of a complex syntactic construction, namely coordinated clauses, as in you like uh, tomatoes and I, looked, I like tomatoes. Um, these are complete sentences that are linked by a conjunction such as and, or, or but. Um, yeah, there's nothing mysterious uh, about this and I think we even had a phrase structure rule that allows us to combine uh, two noun phrases into a coordinated noun phrase and you can easily imagine how the same could be possible with sentences saying that a sentence can consist of a sentence a conjunction and another sentence things start to get a bit more complex if we talk about adverbial clauses adverbial clauses um, sort of represent the prototypical case of a uh, main clause and a subordinate clause. So there's a hierarchy uh, between different clauses. Um, in examples such as, I'm going to the store because we're out of milk, um, the underlined bit is the subordinate adverbial clause. Although he studied hard, John failed the exam. Uh, while it was raining, we stayed in the library. 
So uh, these examples can be analyzed into a sequence of main clause, that's the non-underlined bit, and a dependent clause, uh, that's the underlined bit. The dependent clause is introduced by a subordinating conjunction, such as because, although, while, if, whether, and so on and so forth. Now usually um, the subordinate clause is semantically related to the main clause and uh, usually you can identify a relation such as uh, sequence of time, say uh, when, after, while, uh, cause, because, um, or, or purpose, yeah, um, in order to, something like that. Those are adverbial clauses. <clears throat> One important clause type are relative clauses, uh, as in, I'm looking for the guy who ate my muffin, here's the money that I still owe you, the one I want is on the top shelf, and uh, I don't know who did it. Underlined here are the relative clauses. <clears throat> what is a relative clause? A relative clause is a clause that is dependent on a noun phrase. So whereas adverbial clauses are dependent on some kind of main clause, um, a relative clause really depends on a nominal element. Yeah? Um, and the noun is called the head of the relative clause. In the first example, the guy who ate my muffin, uh, the guy is the head of the relative clause who ate my muffin. Relative clauses in English are often introduced by a relative pronoun, um, like who or that. Um, so who in the guy who ate my muffin, that's a relative pronoun. Um, notice that not all of these examples actually have a relative pronoun. Uh, take the one I want. There, the relative clause does not have an initial relative pronoun. Um, and to make matters still worse, some relative clauses don't even have a head. Uh, they are called headless relative clauses. Um, compare, I don't know who did it, that's a headless relative clause, then there's nothing nominal for the relative clause to link up to, versus I know the guy who did it there, the guy, that's the head of the relative clause. Okay. A fourth uh, construction type here, complement clauses. Um, these are exemplified by sentences like Bill saw that John ate my muffin. Uh, you always forget locking the door. John promised to do the dishes. Or uh, who did it doesn't interest me. Okay, how do we define complement clauses? Complement clauses are clauses that function as subject or object of a verb. So uh, you'll remember that we defined subject and object in syntactic terms. Subject, that's the daughter of S, sister of VP. Object, daughter of VP, sister of V. Right, so in uh, Bill saw that John ate my muffin, the complement clause is the sister node of the verb saw. Yeah. So it's the object of the sentence. Um, in uh, who did it doesn't interest me, who did it is a direct daughter of S and a sister note of the verb phrase doesn't interest me. Semantically, uh, what's interesting about complement clauses is that they often occur with verbs of perception, such as see or hear, um, cognition, forget, remember, or utterance, uh, verbs such as say, or promise. <clears throat> the last construction type that I want to talk about here, uh, those are participial clauses, um, as in John entered the kitchen looking for food. Having eaten my muffin, John left the kitchen and uh, I looked at him stretched out in his bed. Um, again, the underlined bit are the participial clauses. Participial clauses do not overtly express their subjects. So you notice that in looking for food, 
there is no subject expressed. We don't, um, we're not explicitly told who is looking for food, but we know that it has to be John. Um, also in the second example, having eaten my muffin, John left the kitchen. Um, there. Regarde, regarde. J'ai fait un bulle avec ça. Okay, I'm going to finish this. And, um, so, the subject usually is an argument of the matrix clause in which the participle clause is embedded. Can you tell me a little bit So, uh, looking for food. There, John is the subject. Um, and having eaten my muffin, also John from the matrix clause is recruited into the service of the subject. And in, I looked at him stretched out in his bed. Well, it could be I or him, but we know it's him. Yeah, I looked at him stretched out in his bed. Um, participial clauses usually express an event that is happening at the same time as the event that is expressed in the matrix clause. So, um, John entered the kitchen looking for food there. The entering and the looking, they're happening in closed temporal sequence. Or they might be even simultaneous, yeah, uh, that John was looking for food and then entered the kitchen. Hi. Ça va? Oui, ça va bien. Tu travailles? Oui, je te <laughs> Okay. This was an interesting session. Uh, you've recognized, uh, you've, you've met some of the people um, that are walking around the garden. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you next week.